everyone. Go ahead and stand and if you're able.
come uh, to take the offering uh, for us, please, this morning. <coughs> Brother Austin, if you ask for it, let's go. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning again. And we thank you so much for the blessings that you've given each one of us. and You've allowed us to be a part of your work here on earth. And just uh, pray that you would take this offering today and use it for your honor and glory. Lord, it's our desire that uh, more people would hear the gospel through the uh, work that's going on here and also through the missionaries that we support. Just pray your blessings on you. And both those who give and those who are using this for your work elsewhere. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. time and I'm uh, thankful uh, for that and uh, got to see uh, uh, Anna's mom up there, uh, Marsha Harder and other folks around the church there and uh, it's a blessing so uh, there's the Lord. <coughs> brother Dennis. Well, my brother Tom, or our cousin Tom, who fell off the roof, uh, broke his hip, he had a full hip replacement wow. but he's uh, home with his mom right now, uh, mm -hmm. recuperating. Okay. Uh, and uh, I got word that uh, Brother Bridges is taking care of his cat and taking okay. care of his mail. So, okay, praise the Lord. Think, I think they said Thursday he might be able to go home. Okay. This thing's just getting around and taking care of himself. So. All right. But he's, he's healing. Yes. He's, good. he's thankful for prayer. Praise the Lord. Glad, glad to hear that. Yes. Mr. Nathan. Amen. You have a good mom and dad, I'm thankful. <laughs> Amen. Any other uh, phrases? Kitty. Did you put out a body with the zoo and see penguins in the window? Yeah. You know what? The window washer was entertaining the penguins. He was watching well, the yeah. windows, and the penguins were trying to get the big through the glass. Yes. <laughs> He didn't get their tuxedos wet, did he? No. Okay, let's check. They had gotten their tuxedos wet already. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. Any other uh, phrases this morning? Give us that. We're thankful for Miss Ruby being back. Yes, we are. We're thankful for Ruby back with us uh, from North Dakota. And, uh, and uh, she's glad to be back. And we're thankful for that. Glad to look forward to brother back safely. Amen. What's wrong? Uh, we had good news this week. Uh, Lori's mom has a wound on her leg, and the doctor said it's looking very good. So Amen. Healing up good. Okay. Yeah. Good long breaks. Well, praise the Lord for that. That's good. All right. But Austin. Yes, I just praise the Lord for the wonderful life He's given me. It's hard to believe it's. Almost three years. Amen. Yes. Yep. Very 
it goes by quickly, doesn't it? <laughs> yes. There's more. We're thankful for that as well. Amen. All right. Any other uh, praises? Uh, nothing new by way of announcements today. Just be, being prayerful with Williams their way. And, uh, uh, but uh, being prayer for the missions conference coming up. Just seeking the Lord's will as to what God would have you give. Also to use... Uh, the Norris family coming to speak to our hearts and also speak to our hearts through the messages for those next few days during the missions conference that God will burden our hearts afresh and anew uh, for the Great Commission. And uh, we look forward to that. Any other uh, raises this morning? Or any announcements? Okay. All right. Well, uh, let's sing. Uh, song number 125, He Giveth More Grace. Song number 125, 125. He giveth More Grace. <clears throat> 125. <clears throat>
2 Corinthians chapter 10 this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ who in presence am base among you but be absent and bold towards you but I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence wherewith I think to be bold against some which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. <clears throat> Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray for the filling of your Spirit this morning. Help me ministering the Word of God to your people. Help my dear wife Fill her with your spirit, Father. Use her and guide her. Help Brother Brian for us this morning. Bless him with the children there. I thank you for the word that's gone forth already here in this place. The children of Sunday school hour, the adults Sunday school hour. It's been wonderful to sing praises to your name. I thank you for the offering that your people have given which will be used to further the gospel here in Cabalas and around the world through our missionaries. I thank you so much for that. I thank you for the privilege to be a part of this local church and that we could meet here. You provide all of our needs. We thank you. We praise you. Uh, those who cannot be with us might they know we miss them. We're praying for them. And, uh, and Father, just uh, be with each one. And dear God, uh, edify your church this morning. And I pray that you would help us by your Spirit to understand and apply your word to our hearts and lives so that we uh, can walk closely with thee. Father, do help us in these things, we pray. We ask it in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I forgot my thumb drive this morning, so you'll be without an overhead outline. <coughs> The Bureau of Transportation tells us in their statistics that every two hours, and this was from 2010, I think, every two hours, three people are killed in, that, in the alcohol-related highway crashes in the United States. The consequences of drinking and driving are arrests, property damage, injuries, thousands of deaths each year. An estimated 4 million U.S. adults report driving under the influence of alcohol uh, at least once in, in 2010, yielding an estimated 112 million alcohol-impaired driving episodes. Given the rate of driving under the influence of alcohol, it is remarkable that the fatality rate is not greater alcohol related highway crashes account for 13,365 deaths 
in 2010. In addition, alcohol-related highway crashes annually cost Americans an estimated $37 billion. $37 billion. Uh, many jails in, around the country have a designated cell they call the drunk tank. You might have heard of that. A jail cell where it's set aside for the drunk and disorderly until they can come in and sleep it off <laughs> and until uh, they can sober up. Amazing the impact that driving under the influence of alcohol has in our country. Still the number one cause of accidents in the U.S. is not driving under the influence of alcohol. But distracted driving, cell phones, that happy meal, well, maybe the parents wouldn't get a happy meal, but whatever it might be, texting, I drive a school bus, sits up high, I don't know that I ever pass a car that I don't see someone on your cell phone. I do know this, I see more on them than are not. It's an amazing thing, uh, distracted driving. So most wrecks are not caused by wrong drinking, but by wrong thinking. <laughs> you ever do something stupid? Well, I have. And you think, what was I thinking? <laughs> you know? Uh, we know our problems in life, especially our problems in our Christian walk, when we stray, comes from our thinking. It originates in our thinking. The reason is that someone is not, uh, uh, some people perhaps aren't as faithful as to all the church services as they, as they could be. And, and there are valid reasons for that. But some uh, may perhaps, there are not valid reasons. And the problem is, their problem is not that they're not here. That's not their problem. The problem is, why are they not here? What in their thinking thinks that they'd be better off if they could be here and they're not? Something in their thinking is telling them they're better off not going. There's a problem there. There's something wrong in their thinking. The action is just the result of the thinking. And uh, I've entitled the message this morning, God's Think Tank. <laughs> God's Think Tank. I was thinking about the distracted driving. Maybe we should have a think tank for drivers where they can come and, and sit in the cell until they sober up from their addiction to social media. You know, take away the cell phone, uh, you know, to, don't have any deals allowed, and, and, they have, and they have to be separated from, from doing something uh, with, with, with the social media with their hands for a while. Maybe that'll help them drive better when they, when they sober up, so to speak. But our problems come from our thinking. And God, through the Apostle Paul, has shown us that we need a think tank in our life. We need a, we need a place where we examine our thoughts and make sure that they're right with God. And uh, uh, because you know, all of our thoughts, all of our words and deeds come from our thoughts. Come from our thoughts. <clears throat> so this morning's uh, message, God's think tank, uh, we're exhorted to recognize and capture our wrong thought, our wrong thinking, and bring it in obedience to Christ. We're exhorted to do this so we don't wind up with a wrecked life and a ruined testimony. Because somewhere along the line, we've swerved off the highway of God's will. Because we've been driving under the influence of wrong thinking in our life as a believer. Point number one, every believer must practice thought subjection. Point number one, every believer must practice thought subjection. In 2 uh, Corinthians, Corinthians 10 here, uh, Paul writes that we... Uh, <clears throat> We are to bring 
every thought to the obedience of Christ. End of verse 5. Every thought to the obedience of Christ. Now, what are we saying here? We must have the desire to please Christ. By the way, if our number one desire in life is not to live for Christ and to please Christ, then what do you care what you think? <laughs> what do you really care what your actions are or what your words are? What does that matter in the realm of Christianity if our number one, if, if, if we're not living to please Him? There's something wrong right there with our thinking if we're not living for Him first, isn't there? That needs to be changed. See, God doesn't make us live for Him first. He wants us to desire to live for Him first. He wants us to consider what He's done. And we ought to live for Him first. Uh, in, Ro in Revelation chapter 4 and verse 11, the Scripture says about our Lord Jesus Christ, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. You see, I wasn't created for my pleasure. I wasn't created to see how much pleasure I could have in life. I was created for God's pleasure. Amen. I was created for Jesus' pleasure. If you're a believer, by the way, all, 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 all people are created for God's pleasure. If you're a believer, you, you, we, we are to be living for, for the reason we were created. To please God, not myself. To please Christ, not myself. And, uh, and, and, and if, if we're not desiring to please Him first, then the rest of the message really won't be a help to you. But we certainly ought to be, shouldn't we? As believers, we ought to be desiring to please Him first. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and verse 9, the Scripture says, For we labor, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of Him. We want to hear what? Those words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And uh, uh, so that thought subjection, it's realizing that I ought to be living for Jesus. And, 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 and if I want to follow God in that, then I will want my thinking to help me live for Jesus and not be a hindrance to that. And the message now becomes important to me. You see, every believer must practice, number one, thought subjection. Do we want to live for Christ? We do want to subject our thoughts. Number two, uh, in God's think tank, we see thought collection. Number two, we see thought collection. In, in 2 Corinthians 10, uh, the middle of the verse there, it says, 2 Corinthians 10, 5, we are to be bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Bringing into captivity every thought. Collecting those thoughts. You see, when we are astray in our actions, we're not walking in the will of God for some reason, we can be sure there's wrong thinking somewhere in our life. There's wrong thinking somewhere in our life. <clears throat> Uh, the services that we have are for the edification of the saints. Someone who's not here when they could be doesn't realize they're missing some edification. Maybe they uh, need, need to see that, realize that. Wrong thinking. Collecting our thoughts. My wife and I uh, watch some of the crime shows uh, that are on television. I know that she's interested in them because she, she, she does the court interpreting, so that, that's an interest uh, for her. And we watch a lot of those things. And on those uh, crime shows, uh, they're looking for a, when the crime is committed, they're looking for a person of interest. What they used to call a suspect. Maybe, that, maybe that's not politically correct. You know? now, now, it's a, now it's they have a, a person of interest. And so what do they do? 
they begin gathering up all the info on the people that they consider person of interest. Some of we think might have done this, you know. Well, listen, if we're straight out of the will of God, we can be sure that our, that, that our thoughts are the person of interest. <laughs> If we're straying out of the will of God, it's because our thinking is wrong somewhere. And we need to check that out. Thoughts, uh, not actions and words, are the root of our problems. Our thoughts, uh, <clears throat> our thoughts are the source of everything we do and say. When we err in word or deed from the will of God, we can be sure our thoughts are suspect. <laughs> Our thoughts are the, are the person of interest. Wrong living proceed, always proceeds from wrong thinking. And so we need to take that time to consider our thoughts. Peter was preaching in, in uh, I actually think it was uh, Samaria and then he had been saved there, but hadn't received the Holy Spirit yet. Peter and the other apostles began laying their hands on them, and they began receiving the Spirit. There was a man there, uh, Simon the sorcerer saw that, and he said, oh, he says, uh, he says, uh, he offers them money, uh, Give, give me some money so I can have this power. So who I lay my hands on, they receive the Spirit. You know what Peter told him? Repent of this thy wickedness and pray God if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. Because you thought that this gift could be purchased with money. It was the thought of his heart that drove him to ask that question. He said, and what did God, Peter did, Peter did, Peter said, you need to forgive this, what, for the thought of your heart? For the thought of your heart. Every investigation has its person of interest, and you can bet our thoughts are involved when we go, when we go wrong. Uh, in Genesis 8, 21, uh, after the flood, the Bible says, uh, and Noah offered up a sacrifice and such, and the, Lord, uh, the Bible says, the Lord smelled a sweet savor and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. That's where our, our problem often lies. It's, it's in the imagination of our heart. Our thoughts. Our thoughts. But there's hope. Somebody knows our thoughts. Somebody knows we need help there. In 1 Chronicles 28.9, God is, uh, or David is speaking to Solomon. And David says, And thou, Solomon, my son, know thou the God of thy father, and serve him with a perfect heart and a willing mind. There's those thoughts and motives and all that. For the Lord searcheth all hearts and understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts. If thou seek him, he will be found of thee. But if thou forsake him, he will cast thee off forever. You won't be king anymore if you forsake him. And uh, what a, what a, uh, what a, what a, what a, a, a sobering uh, thought. <laughs> God knows our thoughts. By the way, there's hope for our thoughts. See, our thoughts need to be purified. We memorized some time ago, Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Think on these things. See, our thoughts need to be captured. We realize if we get our thinking straight, our living will be straight. Uh, so a thought, reap an action. 
So an action reap a habit. So a habit reap a character. So a character reap a destiny. We need to be careful to think about our thinking. Uh, what thoughts do we dwell on? What thoughts do we dwell on? Uh, human thinking apart from God is really vain. That's why we need to be saturated in the Word of God. So that can affect our thoughts. Some example of some human thinking. One thing we'll often hear one of the litigants, usually the losing one, in, in, in a court case say, they'll make the comment, well, it is what it is. It is what it is. Wouldn't that help? <laughs> yes, it is what it is. <laughs> How does that help us? You know, did we learn anything? It is what it is. Huh. Someone said this, defining love. Love is the feeling you feel. When you feel you are feeling a feeling, you feel you have never felt before. <laughs> now, isn't that helpful? <laughs> oh, my goodness. How about 1 Corinthians 13? I like the Bible thoughts on that. First Corinthians, uh, First Corinthians thirteen. What uh, he says, charity that's love suffereth long. Love puts up with a lot of mistreatment. That's pretty clear, isn't it? Uh, it's kind. This is God defining love. It's kind. It envieth not. That means jealous to the point of you like to, you know, somebody has more than you. We get jealous to the point of we wouldn't actually mind seeing something evil happen to them. Or seeing them lose some of that stuff that they have that we wish we had. <coughs> That's how bad that can get. Charity envieth not. Charity bondeth not itself. It's not puffed up. It's not proud. Uh, seeketh not her own. Doesn't put herself first. That, that's, a, that's a good definition of love, wouldn't you think? Thinketh no evil. Doesn't assume the worst of somebody. And on and on, God explains <laughs> in a way we can understand it and apply it what love is. What love is. <clears throat> We've seen thought subjection, thought uh, collection. <clears throat> Thirdly, we must, every believer must practice thought inspection. See, we gather our thoughts, they must be examined what? In the light of God's Word. Look what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 10, and he says, uh, our weapons, he said, in verse 5, they are there for what? Casting down every high thing that exalted itself against what? The knowledge of God. What do we examine our thoughts in the light of? In the knowledge, in the light of the knowledge of God. Uh, that's what we examine it in, in our thoughts under. That's what the interrogation light is. <laughs> For our thoughts, it's the Word of God. You start thinking about doing something or saying something. So you capture that thought. Keep the lips zipped for a second, or the hand still if you you're signing. And you say, what is the source of that thought? Am I going to say that just because somebody offended me? Am I going to say that just to make me look good? What's the motive? Where is that thought coming from? What is the intent of that thought? When that thought becomes a word... Or when that thought, those thoughts become a deed or deeds, what will be the result of those words or deeds? This is what we're doing while we're examining these thoughts in our lives. 
what will be the fruit of that thought if it comes to fruition? If I do what I'm thinking, what, what is it that I'm going to do? If I, if I say what I'm thinking about saying, what am I going to say? Is that going to be pleasing to God? Is it going to be edifying to those that, are, that I'm speaking to or dealing with? What will the fruits of that thought be? Those words and deeds. Will they glorify God? Are they motivated by love? Useful for edification? In some way? It's interesting. The Old Testament sacrifices, when they were uh, going to be offered to God, they were kept and observed for a little while to make sure that they were an offering worthy for God. What he wanted the offering to be. You see, remember it had to be, certain sacrifice had to be perfect. They couldn't have a limp, or they couldn't have, you know, a scurvy or, or some, some kind of a flaw. So they had to be examined a bit to make sure they were worthy of offering to God. And friends, before we put out our words and deeds, they need to be examined where they're coming from. Uh, our habits in life, uh, is it, are they godly? What thoughts are they coming from? And we need to be examining those thoughts. Ephesians 4.29 Let no corrupt communica communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearer. We are not to say things that would just destroy somebody to no avail. Yes, yeah, sometimes we need to be reproved. And sometimes we, God would use us to in love reprove another. But all always should be for the end that, to help that person to realize the wrong that needs to be corrected. The Apostle Paul surely did a lot of that in his letter to the Corinthians in love, didn't he? And those things need to be said. By the way, when they need to be said, and the Spirit is telling us to say them, we do wrong when we withhold them. See? Uh, the wounds of a friend are better than the kisses of an enemy, the Bible says. And we still need to say what God wants us to say. Will the word uh, that we're going to say in the deed glorify the Lord? Uh, Colossians 3.17 Whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. What a challenge. What a challenge. <clears throat> Examining our thoughts. Larry Burkett is a, a well-known uh, financial analyst and he has uh, uh, different programs and such that he's put out for people to help them live a wise budget and help them to you know, get their income and such under control so that they so that they're not in debt and uh, one of his programs he you throw away no credit cards nothing like that everything you know, everything cash uh, and uh, some people uh, uh, are can't handle a credit card and the proof is they're always in debt and, uh, and, and that, that means that, so they can't that, so what they you know he has a program that teaches them how to how to live by your income by the way when you have a budget your income needs to be more than your outgo okay the income needs to be more than your outgo you say well what do I do about that preacher I can't make any more money I know then you have to decrease your outgo <laughs> the easiest way to Increase your income is to decrease your outgo, okay? And he gives this kind of counsel to people. Somebody asked him, uh, do you keep track of every dollar you spend? Larry Burkett's response was something like this. Absolutely. Every time a dollar proposes to leave, to leave, I say, who are you? Where did you come from? And where do you think you're going? <laughs> And by the way, that's good advice for our thoughts, isn't it? Being careful what we say and what we do. Thinking about those things. Thought inspection. That'll lead us to point number four, thought rejection. 
thought rejection. See, we're going to find, oh, mm, mm, I was just going to say that because I was bad. I'm going to get back at them because, you know, they, 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 you know, they said something, I, I heard they said something bad about me, and, and we realize, hopefully before it blurts out the mouth, or out the hands, uh, that, whoops, that's, that's, I, I shouldn't be saying this. I shouldn't be thinking this. Thought rejection. Uh, look what he says here in verses 4 and 5 about this uh, examining our thoughts. We are bringing into captivity, he says, uh, or look at, look at verse 4, uh, our weapons of our warfare are mighty through God, what? To the pulling down of strongholds. See, we might have been thinking wrong for a long time. And so it's a stronghold in our life. It won't benefit me anymore. I mean, I could go to church, you know, two or three times a week, but once is enough. And you've been thinking that way for a long time. That's a stronghold that needs to be pulled down. Why? Because the believers need fortification, and there's a blessing there. And so the, we, we, there's that thought rejection, casting down imaginations, those things that don't line up with the will of God. Uh, we need to destroy those things. Thought rejection, tearing down that kind of thinking that keeps us from becoming a strong Christian. Uh, keeps us from doing the will of God and becoming strong in the Lord. The thought patterns that are contrary to the revealed will of God must be cast down and denounced as evil. Through resistance of evil and submission to God, they must be cast down and destroyed. I can't afford to tithe. Oops. What's the Bible say? Give. And it shall be given unto you. The hell the Bible says. So what do you have to do to initiate uh, something being given unto you? You have to what? Give first. So to get from God, from in God's perspective of you know, uh, 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 of uh, of uh, having things and giving out things, we have to give first to receive. And if we have to give first to receive, don't you think we have to give to God first to receive? I would think so. Uh, I've never, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, since I was saved, uh, I, I was taught to tithe. And my, uh, my, my, my thinking there is right and found in the Word of God. I can't afford not to tithe. <laughs> Amen. I want God's blessings on what money I have. Amen. And I can't afford not to tithe. And we tithe whether we whether we we're having a struggling to pay our bills or not. We when we when we've lacked, we, uh, when we've had abundance, we've still tithe. And and, and 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 more than that is God is providing. Thought rejection. Uh, companies, automobile companies and such, and companies that manufacture things. They have some system where they have parts inspection. Parts have to meet a certain criteria. For the dentist and some of his the consulting that he does, and uh, he uh, looks at some of these machines and all of their uh, tolerances and all those things have to be able to uh, make the part right. And by the way, they have to have, those employees have to have a system set up whereby they check all their machinery and make sure it's working right and safe. That's part of, what, part of what Brother Dennis does in his consulting business. Uh, the uh, parts inspection. Anybody ever have a car where you had a recall on? Whoops! Airbag blew up. <laughs> Got two black eyes. Better recall those, you know. Oops! The recall was catching on fire and you turned the key. Better recall that. See what happened? A part was defective. And it needed to be what? Rejected. Why? Because when it went ahead and put it into the car, what happened? Problems. Problems. Listen, believer, when we have a wrong thought, it needs to be rejected. If we put it into our life, what's going to happen? You're going to have problems. You say, well, oh, wait a minute, preacher. Uh, uh, not all cars have the same problem with it. I know, but your life's not a car. 
And by the way, God makes sure that if you find out you have a wrong thought and you put that into your life anyway, you will have a problem, I'll guarantee you. You won't, you won't just slide aside, oh, it'll miss me. Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, that's not what the Bible says. That, that thought, thought rejection. And we'll, 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 we'll see that. Uh, being careful about our thinking. <clears throat> Remember when Esther, Queen Esther, Mordecai's niece, they lived in uh, under Persian rule. Israel had been taken captive and Mordecai and his niece were living under Persian rule. And the king took Esther to be uh, one of his wives and he made her queen. An evil servant of the king decided he wanted to destroy all the Jews. So Mordecai began to think, well, maybe God put Esther in this position so she could help her people. She's queen. She could talk to the king about this and maybe save the Jews. But there's one problem. You couldn't just walk in and talk to the king. If you walked in and talked to the king uninvited, And she hadn't been invited. But if you walked into the king and he looked at you and he picked up his scepter and pointed it out to you, then you'd live. And you get to share what you, whatever you came to share. So Mordecai encouraged Esther to do that. She was a little fearful. Uh, in Esther chapter 4, in Esther, She says, I, but I've not been called to go to the king. So Mordecai is going to send a response back to her. They told Mordecai Esther's words. Then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther, think, wrong thinking, think not within thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knows whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Esther, you're a Jew. You can go and maybe God will use you to save all his people. But don't think this. Well, I'm in the palace. I'm the, I'm the queen. You know, I'll just be quiet. And the, the, a, lot of my, a lot of the people are going to die, but I'll, I'll slide by. You know what Mordecai told her? No, you won't. Matter of fact, God will save the Jews and judge you. Wow. See, we don't slide by from God. He knows all our thoughts. He knows uh, when he's shown us a wrong thought and we're supposed to reject it. He knows that. And he, hold, and he holds us accountable for that. Uh, thought rejection. Uh, Proverbs 28, 13. He that overcometh his sin, or I'm sorry, he that covereth his sins shall not prosper. But whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Did you hear that? Did the Bible say, now, most people that cover their sins won't prosper. Is that what God said? No, talking to his people, what do you say? No, anyone, any of God's people who tries to cover their sin, what? Shall not prosper. But whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. 
And God sees to that. That's kind of the, 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 the Old Testament view of uh, or, or, or for Galatians 6, 7, and 8. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, what? That shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. And he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. If we do the fleshly thing when God has shown us not to, God says that will bring corruption in our life. It will bring problems. It will bring corruption. Mark it down. It'll happen. Uh, thought, rejection. You need to reject those, yeah, those evil thoughts, those that are not liable to God. Which brings us to point number five, thought correction. Now what do we do? We put the right thing in place of the wrong thing. Uh, you see, I can give by faith, because my God says what? Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. So every believer can give by faith what God calls them to give. Just give by faith. You see, uh, you, you replace uh, uh, fretting uh, with faith. You replace fear with faith. Well, if I give, I don't know. No, you just replace whatever you want with, with, with faith. You trust God's Word. That's the correction of God's Word. Uh, some people don't read their Bible perhaps every day. Why? There's a wrong thinking there. Just like you need what? Bread every day. I'm, I'm, uh, you know, probably not too many of us go, 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 go uh, too many days without a meal. And yet what? We need the Word of God more than we need physical food. So it's wrong thinking that moves us to skip our Bible reading. We just don't realize how much we need it. We haven't placed the proper value on the Word of God. And so personal prayer comes in, Bible reading, Bible study, church attendance, submission to the Spirit of God. All these things are seen what? And a new thinking, a new life. See, when you remove a rotted beam from a building, you have to replace it with a strong one, don't you? You have to replace it with, with something better. Something that will hold up. By the way, that's the Word of God. Not what you and I think. Uh, thought correction. That's what he has for us there. See, he says, uh, we're going to be bringing every thought, what? To the obedience of Christ. Into submission to God's will. Everything that we, we're going to do, everything we're going to say, bring it into submission to God's will. And then number six, and finally, all these things, <clears throat> what did we look at? Thought subjection. Wanting to do God's will. Thought collection. Gathering our thoughts. Thought inspection. How are they in the light of the Word of God? Thought rejection. Casting down the wrong thinking, getting it out of our lives. Thought correction. Doing the right things. And what does it lead to? Number six, and finally, life perfection. Life perfection. Mature, and I'm not talking about the sin's perfection. I'm talking about the, what the Bible often uses perfection in the, in the idea of being mature. Look at uh, verse 6. Paul says about these, this getting the victory over our thoughts and imaginations. In verse 6 he says, and when that's all done, he says, and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Now, uh, what is he saying there? Well, the Apostle Paul has been teaching the church at Corinth through these letters. Now, remember, in 1 Corinthians, they had done many things wrong, hadn't they? And why was it? Because of wrong thinking. What did Paul do? Constantly, he rebuked them. And exhorted them with what? Right thinking, the Word of God. And he said, get rid of this. Get rid of the wrong thinking and do the right thinking. You'll find that all through 1 Corinthians, by the way, even in 2 Corinthians. Paul continually what? Teaching and rebuking and exhorting and encouraging. Trying to get them from the wrong thinking to the right thinking, which is the Word of God. And... Uh, Trying to be, so he's wanting them to become more mature. Now, in uh, 
in verse 6 here, what he's saying is, he has this own process in his own life, getting victory over thoughts and all these things, and trying to bring them along and maturing them in that. And he wants them to become strong in the Lord. And he says about himself, having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience. Now that revenge means to punish. What, let me tell you what's going on here. Uh, Corinth had some problems. Paul wrote to them, and you know what? They were doing well. They, were, they corrected a lot of them. They had some guy that married his father's wife, and they corrected that one. They, they were picking some favorite teachers. Why? Wrong thinking. Remember what Paul told him? Whatsoever you have is a gift of God. You know, why do we reserve the glory? You know, it seems they got that corrected. They're having some wrong thinking about what? About communion. They get together, have a big dinner and eat too much and get all full. What did Paul do? That's not the Lord's Supper. He corrected them. And by the way, they're getting those things right. Their obedience is growing. But listen, it's not done yet. Because before you're done reading 2 Corinthians, there are still some people there that are saying, Paul's in the flesh. He doesn't even have the right to be an apostle. By the way, they're still there. They haven't been, this hasn't been corrected yet. And what he's saying is, I'm nurturing you along, church, so that you'll take care of these things. So that you, you'll, you'll be the ones that take care when, when people start picking favorite teachers again. You, the church will be strong enough to take care of that. You'll be the one, believers, who when somebody's living in open sin, you'll do what you're supposed to do. By the way, they were doing that in some of those things. But they hadn't quite gone all the way yet. They hadn't quite gone all the way yet. There were still some people there denying the teachings of Paul. And they were saying, his bodily presence is weak, but his letters are strong. Well, when he comes... He, he's not going to do nothing. What's he going to do? Paul says, when I come, I'm trying to bring you along so I don't have to do none of this. So you'll be strong enough to take care of all this yourself in the church. But when I come, I come with a readiness to revenge all disobedience. In other words, to punish disobedience in the church. You see, back then, he had apostolic authority. Well, you say, well, what might he have done? Well, he would see that those who need to be put out of the church be put out of the church. He would do what needed to be done. He would be bold enough to do what needed to be done. You say, well, what if, what if they don't want to, what if they don't want to put him out of the church? What if he doesn't want to go to the church? Then what's he going to do? Well, let's see. Peter blinded the immediately missed the sorcerer. He said, uh, he said, uh, he said, uh, you're, you're going to be, you're going to be, uh, you're going to be uh, uh, blind uh, uh, for, well, actually, uh, <clears throat> you're going to get that right. <clears throat> Sorry, Paul, Paul blinded, he missed the sorcerer. Peter uh, rebuked Simon the sorcerer. Paul had run on to another sorcerer in his ministry. You know what he did? He blinded him. You're going to lose your sight for a while. Remember that? Uh, God does not take care of his people. And I and Sapphira thought they could come in and pull, pull the wool over everybody, everybody's eyes and look great for giving all the money and save some up for themselves. God took care of that, didn't he? He took care of their lives. Took them out of the way. God can take care of his church. Uh, we had a teacher one time in, in, in our missions class. He was he, he was a, a missionary in, in uh, the Sahara Desert in Africa to the nomads and such. And, and uh, they were missionary in this one village. And they had been ministering there. And in this village, they had allowed uh, them to begin teaching the Bible in their in their little school they had there. But they found out there was a change in the. In the, in, in the government there, and they were going to be sending a ruler to that village who, when he got there, his tendency was he would not allow them to continue to use the Bible and to continue to teach those in, in, in the schools in that village. That was his practice. 
And so they began to pray. And they prayed, God, please make a way that we can continue this. Please help us. You know, we don't see how we're going to be able to continue. If this person comes and puts in the policies here where they put it elsewhere, we're not going to be allowed to do this. And they prayed for God to work that out. You know what happened? That man was killed in a car accident on his way to the village. They didn't pray for his death. They prayed for God to work it out. You know how God chose to work it out? Okay, I'll take care of the problem. And God removed that person from the earth. Listen, God, can, God knows how to handle this church. Amen? God knows how to handle his people. And, uh, and by the way, he always does it. Uh, in love. He always does it uh, for, for, for our good. Life perfection. Romans 12, 1 and 2, and I'm done. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. There's life perfection. How? By the renewing of your mind. That's got to come first. Our lives are transformed when our thinking and our minds are transformed. By the renewing of your mind. That ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Until we're convinced that God's will is best for us, we'll never want to follow it fully. We'll never care to follow it fully. We'll think we'll get by here or there. We don't really need it. Until we're convinced it's best for us and we need it. And our thinking begins to align with that. It is then that we'll be able to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice unto God. Uh, through the thinking that will come from that. Because we have aligned ourselves uh, uh, with, 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 the, with the things of God. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your church this morning. I thank you for the Word of God. And Lord, we know uh, that you're so merciful. Lord, time and again, uh, we've sinned against you. And it really didn't seem like uh, much happened. But Lord, thankfully, at some point, you convicted us by your Spirit. We got it right and went on with you. We thank you and praise you for that. But Father, help us to remember, neither are we to tempt you. Because, because you have, your mercies have been so, so full and so free toward us. Because we can often always come to the throne of grace to obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We thank you for that. But help us never to take that for granted. Dear God, you want us to have right thinking, to align our minds with your word, that our lives then might be aligned with your will. And God, it's only through, it is only through this think tank that you have set aside for us that we can have hope that our, that our lives will be transformed. Thank you for the Word of God. Thank you for the Spirit of God. Thank you, dear God, for your blessed Son who's made this indwelling Spirit possible. Jesus Christ purchased this life for us, sent the Spirit to live in our hearts the moment we trusted in what your blessed Son did. Father, we know your Spirit in us is the Spirit of Christ. It is your Spirit. It is the Spirit of God. And I pray that you conform us more into your image as the days go by for your glory. Help us to be careful to thank you and praise you. We ask you in Jesus' name for his glory. Amen. Amen. Stand and we'll be dismissed for the song. Number 491. These are all on the altar. thoughts come to mind that need to go on the altar, need to get that right even now, 491, <clears throat> any new thought, godly thoughts need to be built in and established, need to get those things right, these are all on the altar.